Good morning, everybody. I hear that song. I think I come up and do a little dance or something while I was... But it's so great to see all the kids um, heading back. We really appreciate Pastor Gus and Carrie. And uh, Pastor Mike is speaking at the uh, church in East Berkshire today. So be praying for him as he brings the word up there. Uh, the pastor's on a vacation there. As you probably know, we had our annual meeting. Boy, it seems like a year ago. You guys all rested now? Are you? Yeah, yeah, it's been a week, and uh, we, uh, we want to thank all of you for, that were here for the annual meeting. If you had, did not get to the meeting and you're curious about the, uh, um, the outcome of that, we can share some of that with you today. We will be praying for our new elders that were approved and, and thanking those who are stepping off the board. Our board of elders uh, functions with a three-year term, and then the elder takes a year off, gets a chance to do some other things. We still keep them in the loop, but they don't have to come to the meetings and so on. And it allows us to have uh, room for some new folks to come on. And then we also approved our budget and um, the budget for the coming year. And that is part of a document that is out in the lobby for you there. It, it's the Church of the Rock Annual Report. It also has some very uh, good uh, um, reports from the various ministries, uh, the pastors and the uh, heads of the various ministries, so it kind of brings you up to date on the things that happened and the goals that we have for the future. As Sherry, our secretary, put it, this is our history, and so this really allows us to have a snapshot of what the Lord did for us in the year 2012 and what we're praying for in the year 2013. So if you didn't get one of those, please Feel free to pick one up. doesn't matter whether you're a member or visiting. Whatever the case, this is something that's available for all of you. I'd like to ask if our elders would come up at this time. And we're going to bring a whole crowd of people up because I'm going to ask that our elders from last year, uh, as well as our newly elected elders, would come up. That would be uh, Lucy Cunningham, Taylor Yates, and Ryan Clements. And uh, ask if you'd all come up, all who are in this service. I don't know if we ever get everybody all at one time. Probably pretty close, though. Yeah. Trish is with the kids. Yes, Trish is working, we, and it's been she's been a real blessing. Uh, Jack, you'll have to say thank you for, to her on our behalf. Uh, it's so good to have elders uh, ministering in many different aspects of the church, so that when we come together to make decisions, we can can feel what God is is uh, doing in those places. We don't have to just simply guess, and. Um, so I'd like to, first of all, thank those that uh, have served uh, in the past, uh, past, I don't know how many years, but are taking their, their year break. Sue, on behalf of all of us, give that to you and Dave, and where's Brian, right here, and Claude. Thank you so much. Claude's only been on the board for how many, like? <laughs> it's sort of like the first books of Gen first chapters of Genesis. It's, it's, you see the number and you don't say, that can't be so, but... Uh, uh, Claude and Barb uh, are very special friends of ours. We go back to when we first came and all of our kids were tiny preschoolers. Yeah, so uh, we really appreciate, Sue, we appreciate all the many ways that you have ministered and do and will continue. We know you'll be probably just as busy, if not busier, but hopefully this will give you a little break from the, 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 the eldership. And Brian, again, uh, Brian was our, our young elder for... You felt so lonely so many times. So now we've kind of outdid you. We asked uh, Ryan to come on. So you'll have to give him pointers on, on how, to, how, how to survive among the older folks. But uh, it's been a real blessing. And I know we'll be looking to you folks in, in a year's time. But we pray this will be a good year for you. And then um, we just want to thank uh, Ryan and Rissa for uh, agreeing to take this big step. Uh, Young Adults has been a an aspect of our ministry that to me has just been one of the most wonderful things that has happened in so many years. Uh, there's been sort of a thought among many of us pastors that you don't have a way as a church, especially a church that focuses on kids and families and so on, to reach the young adults that are maybe just in or out of college and just getting their, their lives started. And um, a few years ago, we brought Pastor Mike on board. I wish he were here to uh, hear what we have to say here, but he dug into um, doing young adult ministry, and um, either he knew or quickly discovered that it would be a different kind of ministry, one where you do more listening and more sharing and more answering of questions and just doing life together than anything else. And uh, 
So I'm just so excited that that is what we have here. How, how big is our group? 15, 18? Uh, three, three new members on Monday. There you go. Not members, you know. People yeah. came to yeah. the group. I'd say we've got 30 to 40 people. 30 to 40. Rotate in and out. Yep. So, Praise the Lord. <laughs> and uh, so it's just, uh, it's exciting to be able to have a, someone on the board of elders who doesn't just agree with that happening, but is right smack in the middle of that, and we really appreciate them. And then, uh, just to balance things out, we asked Taylor if he would come on. <laughs> now, Taylor and Marcia have just been a very, very influential in outreach projects, and in many other ways. They greet you at the door, and in many unseen ways that they are a blessing. And one of the big burdens that the Lord put on our hearts from some years ago, and especially we've been seeing that fulfilled more and more in the last several years, is outreach. And uh, they have a real heart for that, among many other things, but I'm looking forward to the ways that they will, will help spur us forward in, in being out in our community. And then Lucy, um, coming back to the board, she, she has, did you have a good year off, by the way, did you? Yes, I did. did your kids keep you busy? Yes, okay. <laughs> so now she'll have one excuse once a month not to babysit if she wants to. But she, it's the hockey games, yes. Yeah, she's a hockey mamita, right? <laughs> and, uh, it's, and again, we just appreciate the many ways that you work with so many groups, especially our ladies. And I know that the two of you with your groups here on Tuesday and Wednesday, I, I get to um, just see a little bit of and listen down the hall to a little bit of the fellowship and ministry that's going on. I really appreciate you. So could we just have a, a time of prayer? Could we just bow our heads together? What I'm going to ask is that the three, that the uh, returning elders would stand here and the ones that are going off, would you just lay your hands on their shoulders and we're going to just pray the Lord will pass on. Uh, maybe Sue, you could pray for uh, Lucy and Brian, you could pray for, for Ryan. And um, Claude, if you could pray for Taylor. Just pray over, just pray over them. And I'm going to ask Claude if he would lead us in prayer together. Father, we pray for uh, Taylor Yates, Lord, and um, we pray, God, that you would uh, anoint him as you already have, Father. We just uh, pray it, Lord, so we recognize it uh, publicly, Lord, uh, with the mantle of... Um, servanthood, Lord, that is um, an official servant instead of just a regular servant. Uh, Lord, he has already shows, Lord, the, uh, the fruit of the Spirit, Lord, in so many ways. And we pray, God, that you would just anoint him for the work that uh, is going to transpire in the next three years. Uh, pray that you would give him vision, give him um, wisdom, and allow him, Lord, to be a man of influence even more so than he is. And allow him, Lord, to uh, hear your voice clearer than he's ever heard it before, Lord, so he can impact uh, this kingdom work, Lord, that is happening here in Franklin County in a great and mighty way. In Jesus' name. Praise you, Lord. I just thank you so much for Ryan and just lift him up. Just give him the wisdom and, the, and just the the knowledge of you being with him and I just let you just him be an enlightenment for the elder board with his youth and his just a different look and a different vision of what our church is to look like and just let him be able to just break down some boundaries and bring up the church of the future I just thank you so much for this opportunity and I thank you and I just pass the torch on to him as and just let him lead and guide the youth and the young adults throughout Franklin County and just let us find where we need to be. And thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, pray. And Lord, we thank you for our sweet sister Lucy. Lord, I thank you for the year that you uh, blessed her with a time of refreshment and restoration and her seeking you, Lord, more closely. Lord, I thank you that you have called her back and that you have great things and great projects in store for her, Lord God. I pray that all that refreshment would be utilized in the ministries that you have set before her, Lord God. We ask that you would fill her with your Holy Spirit so that she might be able to pour out all that you have shown her 
into those uh, others' lives that uh, need a touch from the Holy Spirit, Lord God. I pray that as a board, they would all be unified and that they would um, hear clearly from you, Lord, what it is you want them to do for our church and for uh, one another and for all the people that we have yet to touch, Lord God. We just thank you that uh, you have called us, called her to uh, a, a place where she can reach out and share just what you ask her to, Lord. We thank you for her. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, everybody. God bless you all. And uh, I just would encourage you as, a, as people who attend our church to um, reach out to all of these folks. If you have any need whatsoever, and uh, they will pray with you. They'll brainstorm with you. They'll come with your permission and, and uh, share with uh, other elders or with the pastoral staff, uh, whatever your concerns might be. And I, it, it is not possible, as pastors understand very quickly, that it's not possible to, to do church. Um, it just is not possible to do church on our own. I didn't mention Lee Fansteel. Lee, I don't see Lee here today. I know Lee is recovering from a... And, um, knee replacement, and Lee is also coming back onto the board, so we want to include him as well in that. We'll, we'll uh, welcome him when he has a chance to be here. Speaking of knee replacements, we do have a new knee here somewhere in the building, huh, Tom? Welcome back. Yeah, it's a, um, th let's see. That knee isn't quite a week old, is it? Yeah, not quite, yeah. So uh, if, if he looks like he's in pain, we'll send somebody out with a snow shovel to bring in some ice in for him, and we'll pack him up there. But uh, we appreciate those that have been providing meals and, um, and just basically uh, keeping an eye on him. I understand his daughters are doing a good job this weekend. I had him on special orders that if they really needed something, they were to call me because I knew he probably wouldn't get around to it. But we never did get a call, so... In your uh, bulletin this morning, or actually for a bulletin this morning, you received a pamphlet with a little flyer inside. And um, in keeping with the fact that the Lord called us, calls us together to do business and to make plans for the future, uh, trusting him for his resources and also asking him how to use those resources, we wanted to make this little booklet available to you. It's sort of a starter uh, in case you're looking at your finances and wondering whether they are the way that God wants them to be or not. It's a very personal thing, and we thought this could be something you could take home with you. Included with it is a little paper I'll talk a little bit more about in the message. Uh, we're going to take some time next Sunday, and probably we'll just follow that up for a couple of weeks for those who weren't able to take part next Sunday, to um, write down on a simple little piece of paper uh, the amount of money that the Lord is calling us to give on a monthly basis to the church and also uh, the money that he is challenging us to pledge toward a special offering that we'll receive several times over the course of the year for the roof that needs to be finished for the plow truck that we didn't have for this last storm big thank you to Claude for coming down and plowing and um, but we do want to pr provide for that need so in keeping with this whole idea of learning to trust God and ask if Claude would come up I know he he shared with me that um, they're just some things that the Lord put on his heart, and I think they'd be a real blessing to you. When Pastor was talking about giving last week, and I thought, well, usually in Franklin County, when that, that subject is brought up in a church, it's, um, it's very... Uh, you, you, most pastors don't preach on that because people are always very tight with their money, and church is always after your money. I mean, that's the, the usual uh, understanding of of churches and I've actually met several people over the course of the last several years who've told me that they never went back to a church when they passed the basket in front of them and they had no money they had nothing they had eight kids and no money and the guy with the basket shook it in front of them like come on you're holding out on me and they never went back to church and so giving um, <clears throat> in the way that God um, sees it is totally different than the way a lot of times man sees it so this is the, I'm coming up on 40 years since I said the sinner's prayer and came to the Lord. And one of the first things I did when I came to the Lord was I read the Bible through like three times. Just read it through, read it through. And I came across the story of Abraham doing the raid 
and saving a lot and bringing all the people back. And then he gave 10% to uh, Melchizedek, the high priest. And before I ever heard anybody mention the word tithe, or anybody ever mention anything about giving, I can remember saying in my heart, Lord, that, that would be a real test of faith to do that. And so I said, from now on, that's the way I'm going to live. And I, it was easy at the time because I had no money. And uh, <clears throat> I, I went through a whole semester of college on 25 bucks. Um, but um, when, <clears throat> when I first came to this church, uh, I came from a church that probably had 1,000 or 1,500 people on the rolls of the church. And I came to this church, and I noticed that the weekly offering, and this was a church that at that time of about maybe 50 people, and it was a bunch of young couples with kids and everything, the monthly giving was the same amount as it had been at the church that I had been at before, which had about 1,500 people on the rolls. And I can remember thinking, oh, maybe I'm not the only one that is trusting God. Because I couldn't believe it. The, uh, I don't remember what it was, $1,000 a week or 2000 a week or whatever it was. And it was 50 people, and they were giving as much as, as this other church where they had 1,000 people. So I, um, I learned very quickly God is trustworthy. And throughout our lives, and I don't know if you have anything you want to share with us about this, Barb, but um, we have lived our lives uh, in absolute wonder at God's provision. And there's a bunch of scriptures that I, I love and that we live by. Um, and I wrote some of them down because I didn't want to forget them. Um, he who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. To not despise small beginnings. When um, a, a, a parishioner came up to a pastor one time and he said, Boy, Pastor, you know, if, if, if I win the lottery or if I have, um, you know, if this business deal goes through, I'm going to have a lot of money. I'm going to give a lot of money to the church. And the pastor said, well, what about that five you've got in your wallet right now? And um, <clears throat> the gist of the story is the pastor said, I have not known man's generosity to increase with his riches. So you remember the story of the widow's mite? She gave one penny or half a penny, and it was more than the rich guy who put in a, a huge amount. So God is not looking for amounts. God is looking for our hearts. And if we are faithful to give our little, he is more than faithful. And for years, we lived with, with very little money and very little um, assets of any kind. And, um, but never, ever have I been hungry and not had enough food. Never have I not had a roof over my head. Never have I not had clothing. Um, and you say, well, yeah, that's great. God, you know, he gives you subsistence living. No. I came that they might have life, and they might have it abundantly. And the things that I've been able to do over the course of the last 40 years, they're just unbelievable. I never would have imagined. And recently, and this, and remember, this is after 40 years of trying to be faithful to the Lord, you know, you always hear those testimonies. Yo, I gave him a hundred dollars and I got a thousand, or you know, I gave a thousand and I got ten thousand. Well, that kind of stuff has started to happen to me. Um, during Hurricane Sandy, <clears throat> my wife and I we just felt like we got to do something, and we didn't know what to do. So I called up Convoy of Hope and I said, "Here, you know, I'm, I'm going to send you some money." Within a week, I had ten times as much, and several times that has happened in the in recently. So I don't say you you don't give to get. But God rewards faithfulness. And so over the course of our lives, we have seen him um, just do amazing things. Um, one person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous man will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. I'm just here to tell you, after 40 years, those verses are exactly true, and God is completely faithful. There is no, um, no doubt about it. Um, <clears throat> do not be afraid, little flock. Luke 12, 32. I think you used this one last week, Pastor. For your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. I'm, when I first came to the Lord, my, my impression of God up to that point was that he was up in heaven with a baseball bat, 
ready to club me at the first opportunity when I screwed up. And I've since learned a long time ago that God is ready, willing, and able to bless us. And all he says is, all right, I want you to grow. I want you to trust me. And it's not, Lord, if you give it to me, I'll give it to you. The Lord says, no, trust me. Take a, walk, take a step out on that tightrope wire and believe that I'm going to hold you up. And it's a totally different way of thinking, but whenever the offering plate goes around or whether the missionary comes and there's a, um, an opportunity to give, you know in your heart right away if you're saying, oh, crap, another offering. I just, you know, they're always asking for money. Or if you are saying, Lord, what can I do here? How can I be a blessing? I trust you. I'm not going to worry about, you know, what happens after this. How much can I bless you? It's a totally different mindset. And um, I just want to testify that my God has been faithful to me for a long time. And when Pastor said, you know, Pastor was preaching on giving, he said he was going to preach for a few weeks. And I said, boy, you ought to get somebody to give a testimony. Be careful what you suggest to Pastor Roland. <laughs> um, I'm going, to, I'm going to give one other example. This, is, this was in our lives. This is not in anybody else's life. This is the way God led us. When we were living in an apartment with no money and very little money, um, somebody said, hey, you guys qualify for this government program. They'll give you all kinds of food and everything. And, and if, we got all excited. And then we looked at each other and we said, are we going to trust God or are we going to trust the government? I mean, again, this is just us. This is the way God was working with us. And we looked at each other and we said, we're going to trust God. And so we never um, partook of that. And funny thing, we never were hungry. We never had a, a, um, a need go unmet. So that's my testimony. I praise God that after um, all these years, um, I can give you that kind of a report. But as pastor is preaching about um, giving, and in fact, that, is anybody here this week that was here last week for the first time? Because I thought, oh my gosh, if somebody comes on the first time and he's preaching about money, they're going to go, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. That's, that's it. Do you want to sh share anything, dear? I want to thank you for another way that you, many of you, gave so generously. My, uh, my father-in-law and my mother-in-law were extremely ill. At really very near death. My mother-in-law actually sort of looked down the tunnel and decided not to go. And um, <clears throat> we put uh, the prayer request out on the, on the Facebook, the prayer chain. I got a card back from my, from my father-in-law. If I can get through this. Roland and Sue told us, this is to you, we had been put on your prayer list at your church. So thank you so much for your prayers and your caring. We were feeling pretty low and very sick. With your help, we are well again. Thank you again, Harold Boydston and Johan Boydston. Isn't that beautiful? And that really touches our hearts, as you can imagine. I just hope that, that, that you will take advantage of that same, that same resource. Uh, Linda, you had a little a word from the Lord that he hides us in the, in the rock when all the storm comes by and nobody's too little or insignificant. And uh, so whatever that need is that you have, we encourage you to just go to Church of the Rock online, Facebook, or I think that's what it's called, right? The church, just type Church of the Rock on Facebook and you'll find us. And you can post there. Um, and um, uh, Sherry and, and we, several of us sort of go over the posts on a regular basis. Uh, it's one great way to get a prayer request out there. And um, it's amazing to see like, 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 what the, what is, and then the comments, you know how Facebook works. Well, you actually find out how many people are probably praying for that need. Well, my wife came back after a couple of hours and said, 25 people have said, you know, have responded. And uh, yeah, that's how it works when the body of Christ finds out about a need. Let's just bow our heads together and uh, just thank the Lord for his provision. And Father, we thank you that we can come to you. We thank you, Lord, for you being the God who cares and the God who heals. We thank you, Lord, that Tom is uh, here, successful surgery. We thank you for Mark and Lynn and their ministry to him. 
for those that are helping provide food. And, and uh, Lord, I thank you for him and his girls. Pray your blessing over this next week. Pray your continued healing for Lee. And I know that uh, there's another gentleman who is anticipating knee surgery soon. We pray your blessing in his life. Pray for Gordon Sweet, that you would please bless him. And thank you that he came out of the intensive care. We pray you would continue that healing in his body and strengthen him. We pray, Lord, for Angel O'Rourke. You would help her to be able to uh, eat solid food, be able to get home. And Lord, we pray that you would bless Tom and help him Help them, Lord, as a family, be able to feel, know, and experience your love, not wonder why they're having such difficult times, but instead just be wrapped up by the love of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray for all of those that are dealing with hardships and difficulties at this time. We pray protection over the, those that are serving our country. We pray, Lord, that you keep them safe, and we pray, Father, that you bring them home safely with a mission well done. As we go to your word, we just pray now that you open our eyes and to see what it is you would say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you see some words back on the screen that you carry around in your pocket that, you, that are on that piece of paper that you hand to all sorts of people or that are on those virtual pieces of paper that um, are passed back and forth in our society when you use your debit card or when you pay a bill online. In God we trust. Did you ever wonder where that phrase came from? Well, the story goes all the way back to September of 1814. A young American stood on the rail, by the rail of a British warship. He had gone to negotiate <clears throat> the release of a friend from British captivity during the War of 1812. And because he was on that ship at the beginning of the battle for Baltimore, he was not allowed to leave, and he was forced to watch the bombardment of Fort McHenry. If the fort fell, then the British, who had already conquered Washington, D.C., had burned it to the ground, would now take over Baltimore, would just continue a conquest of this newly liberated United States of America. We know that young man's name. It was Francis Scott Key. He was 35 years old at the time. And all night long, he watched through the bombardment to see if the fort would stand or if it would fall. During the night, because it was a rainstorm, because of all of the, and all of the bombardment, the defenders had put up a very small storm flag once the rain and the fog set in, it was no longer possible for him to see the fort, so he waited until dawn. And when he looked out, he watched to see the mists uh, dissipate. And if he could see the flag, he would know that, <clears throat> that the fort had not fallen. Well, during the night or in the early morning, the defenders took down the small storm flag and they took out instead their biggest flag, the big ceremonial flag, and they ran it to the top of the pole to let the entire British fleet know and anyone else who was watching that the Star Spangled Banner was still there. And that is the story that gave, of course, rise to our national anthem. But in the fourth stanza, did you know there was more than one stanza? Did you already think it's a little long for the beginning of every event? So there are four stanzas. Let me read you the fourth stanza because in the fourth stanza come some words that would later become the national motto of the United States. Oh, thus be it ever when free men shall stand between their loved home and the war's desolation. Blessed with victory and peace, may heaven-rescued land praise the power that hath made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause it is just, and this be our motto, in God is our trust. And the star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave o'er the land of the free, the home of the brave. Those little words, in God is our trust, resurfaced some years later when America found itself in the midst of the Civil War. It was at that time in 1864 that the, uh, that the government decided to begin putting the words, in God we trust, on our coins. It was a time of great need, a time of dependence upon God, and so for the first time our coins began to carry this motto. Uh, for some years the motto was off the coins, back on the coins, and so on, until jump ahead almost a hundred years, the middle of the Cold War, 1956, 1957. And it was at that time that America found itself facing another threat, uh, the entire communist bloc, atheistic to the core. And it was at that time that the Congress then voted to bring back those words, those words that had first been penned by Francis Scott Key, in God is our trust, now as a motto, in God we trust. And they voted that Remember, e pluribus unum, 
You always looked at that and said, I have no idea what it says. Those words were taken off the list as national motto, and the words in God we trust were put in their place. There's a certain irony, I guess, in putting such a bold and wonderful statement of trust in God on cold, hard money. We've all heard the joke, in God we trust, all others pay cash. In fact, very often the battle of trust is fought between the God on the money and the money itself. As Jesus put it in Matthew 6, 24, you can't worship two gods at once. Loving one God, you'll end up hating the other. Adoration of one feeds contempt for the other. You can't worship God and money both. Now, as we all know, putting the motto in God we trust on our money doesn't make us believers in God. Those words, however wonderful and however high-minded, do not inoculate us from greed. They do not all by themselves make money any less of an alternative God. So here's the question. Are the words in God we trust more than just a motto? And the answer to that question is up to each one of us to decide whether or not the words are printed on the bills in our wallets and the coins in our pockets. When you turn to the very last book of the Old Testament, you find the same question being raised. Is the idea of trusting in God something real, or is it just a motto? This question was posed to a little nation that had been through a terrible war, total defeat, the loss of its homeland, the displacement of most of its surviving population. It had lost its place of worship. It had seen all of its cities burnt to the ground. It had lost the ability to create its own laws and govern itself. It had lost every notion of freedom. As this little nation was defeated by Babylon, there was no glorious last stand with Jerusalem's flag waving over the ramparts against the relentless attacks of the Babylonian army. There was no star-spangled banner that the Jewish people could sing. Their songs were songs of loss and despair. We read in Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? But then some 70 years after the destruction of Jerusalem, God intervened in a marvelous way. The Babylonian Empire was replaced by the Persians, and the new king ordered that the Jewish people be permitted to go home, rebuild their temple, rebuild their city. Once again, they'd be able to sing the songs of Zion in their own land and worship God. And that's what brings us to this last little book of the Bible, the book of Malachi. Malachi was witness to what I would call the new normal that settled in after the Jews had come home and began to re begun to rebuild their lives. He saw that although the first pioneers to come were filled with zeal and excitement and had put their trust in God to carve out this new life, this restarting of their national life, he saw that a new normal had begun to slip in, one in which the words in God we trust would be more of a motto than a lifestyle. So what did the new normal look like? Well, their worship of God had become compromised. The clergy had become corrupt. The sacrifices were inferior, even insulting to God. The rich once more oppressed the poor and the needy. You see all of these things spelled out as God brings charges against his people in this little book of Malachi. And then there was the issue of giving their money to God. We turn to Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Here we are with God speaking to his people in the midst of this new normal after they've been blessed, but now they're starting to regress and God's becoming more of a motto than a reality. Verse 8 says, God speaking, Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you're under a curse, your whole nation, because you're robbing me. Now to understand this complaint, 
we have to understand that God had entered into a solemn agreement with his people, a covenant, like a marriage, if you will, or like a, a treaty between two powers. It was a, a covenant that couldn't be broken without consequences. It wasn't just a temporary sort of thing like, like an athlete signing up with a team for a couple of years. But this was a forever promise. And in this agreement, God said, I'll protect you and I'll provide for you. I'll give you a land. I'll make you prosper. But he also said, your obligation is to trust me. And I want you to demonstrate that trust by giving back to me 10% of what I give to you. This would allow them to both remember and demonstrate that their trust was not in their own wealth or their own abilities or their own, their own success, but in the God who created them and blessed them. I wonder how often the same sort of thing happened that happened to the Jewish people happens in our lives. Like Francis Scott Key, there may have been a time in your life when you found yourself staring out into the gloom and while the battle raged around you. Would God come through or would the flag come down in defeat? It was one of those times when you couldn't control the outcome. Maybe you were in a hospital room or maybe you were pacing the, the hallways of your house wondering how the finance, financial situation would turn out or maybe you were looking for that job or whatever the case might be. So you cried out to him, put your trust in him and when morning came, the flag was there. God came through, the promises were met and how easy then to say, in God we trust. Or perhaps you found yourself like these Jewish people in exile, cut off from your real destiny. But you heard God calling you to step out in faith, put your trust in him and him alone. And when you did, he, he brought you home and he restored relationships and he set you free from things that controlled you and gave you a whole new life. But you know what happens after those climax moments in our lives, those glorious times of victory, those times of breakthrough? this new normal begins to set in. Just ask somebody who's made a heroic effort to lose the 30 pounds and come back to them a year later and what do you find's happening? It's a whole different battle. Or maybe you had a breakthrough in your relationship and, and with your spouse and you really learned how to communicate and you really applied yourselves and then as things get settled, ah, there's more TV time creeping in and less talking time and so on. We know the same thing can happen in our relationship with God. We can take the blessings for granted. We can find ourselves depending on him less and less, depending on ourselves more and more. Looking at our job, looking at our bank account, looking at all the new things we can acquire as being more and more important. You can tell just how captured you are by the new normal, by how much of an imposition it is to even think about giving God your money. Especially in a planned and consistent way. It's far easier to just print the words in God we trust on a dollar than to give God 10 cents out of every one of those dollars. So what's the path out of the compromise and the faithlessness of that new normal that stalks every single one of us? Well, God spelled it out to his people. He didn't just bring a complaint to them, but he gave them a way out. And that's when we turn to Malachi 3.10, 11 and 12, and we find God saying, Here's where you are, but here's where I can bring you. He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be, not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. God proposed a test. That's right. God said, I dare you to try to outgive me. Is this about resources? Is this about having enough? Is this about reaching the maximum that you can meet, reach in your life? Well, he says, basically, it's sort of like the arm wrestle thing. Come on over to the table. Let's see who can give the most. Try me. This is a trust test, pure and simple. You give back to God in a planned and consistent way, that 10% God has given you, and then God throws out the calculator and buries you with more. 
Sounds too good to be true? Well, it all depends on how big your God is. I find it interesting that when God talks about the blessings that he wants to bring, he says, I'm going to prevent things from happening that you couldn't have prevented on your own. Now, people couldn't stop pests from coming into their fields. You and I can't stop a, a recession or can't stop um, a, a, a corporation from changing its hiring strategies or whatever. We live as really much more uh, at, at the disposal of others than we want to admit. The very fact that we can get up in the morning and go out the door to work or get up and fix food for the family or whatever we do is not a given. Anybody ever have a bad back? It amazes me when my back goes out. Man, I wish I could just get up and brush my teeth, but I can't. The thought of going to work, it's not possible. And I realize, wow, Lord, what a blessing it is to be able to get up and just do life. God says, I'll protect you in ways you never even imagined you were under threat. I'll bless you. Now, the God who offered this challenge to his people in Malachi's time is the same God who challenges you and me to trust him today. In Malachi 3, 6, we read these words, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. As followers of God's son, Jesus, we have become descendants of Jacob. We're part of God's family. And he's the same creator God who dared his people to trust him in very practical ways, even with their money. Like the people of Malachi's day, you and I face a choice. We can go on living a new normal, whereby the phrase, in God we trust, is a motto. Sounds good, makes us feel good when we say it, but doesn't cost us anything. Or we can step out in faith and put God to the test with that same money. We can make a prayerful commitment to give to his work in a planned and consistent way. Trusting him, not only to make up the difference in our monthly bills, but to bless us as only he can bless. Once again, let me read you those words that God said to his people. Test me in this, says the Lord God Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing there will not be room enough to store it. Once again, in, your, uh, in, in this little brochure is a piece of paper. Next Sunday, I'm going to ask that you come, we'll hand you another one of these, or you can bring back the one you have with you, uh, that you would prayerfully fill this out. Again, we're not interested in names. We're, we are not going to follow up on this in people's lives. This is something that you do between you and God. That's why we're here as a church. Uh, Claude's story, Barb's story could be told hundreds of times over with folks that have, have said, I'm going to give to God just as he gives to me. I'm going to give back that portion of what he has given to us. And uh, Our church does that. I don't know if you know that or not, but we tithe 11% of everything that comes to the church out to the various missionary works, some of them represented by the flags around you, some of them in our community. And just, we have seen as a church that we couldn't outgive God. I those of us who are pastors in the Assemblies of God, we give uh, to the Assemblies of God, to those, our district, in a very planned way because you can't outgive God. And God has blessed and he has, he has blessed us beyond anything we can imagine. So while we want to encourage you to be a part of that, your planned giving, we're going to ask you to figure out what you would give on a monthly basis. We can all sort of use the same metric there. You might give once a week, you might give twice a month. We don't know what your schedule would be, but saying on a monthly basis. And then we're going to add that up and see, uh, just celebrate the number that represents what God wants to do through us. And then several times this year, we're not going to do it next week, but several times this year, we're going to take a special offering, and that is going to go toward uh, some very necessary repairs here at church. Uh, and actually, if we can take that offering and cover the cost of the roof, that will make the budget uh, less stressed by the fact that we're paying on a little loan for the half of the roof that we've already done. So we're going to see the Lord really bring us forward, allow us to step out in some new ways. Please be in prayer as, as you go through your, your week, as you talk things over together. I want to thank all of you who are giving and have been giving. Uh, 10%, you say, oh, 10%. Well, as Claude, you read a scripture that said, if you're faithful in a little, be faithful in much. But the important thing is not the size of the gift, 
but the fact that you're trusting. So you and the Lord will figure that out and together we'll be able to say from the heart, not just as a motto, in God we trust. Let's bow our heads together. Ask if our team would come up, the music team. And our prayer team, if they would come at this time. Shall we stand together? Lord, we thank you that we can can come to you at this time, Lord, and just learn trust. I know there's so many ways that we will need to learn that this year. Money's only one of them. There's so many others. Lord, I pray you would just show us how to step out and see that you're real. Yes, I know. And others can see it as well. In Jesus' name. Amen.